So I'll be kind of the moderator and keep things flowing. And the first thing I wanted to ask our panelists, and I'll end up with me um, saying the same things, is to give us a little bit of the context. Um, how is your agency structured? What's the population of your city? What's your budget like? Um, what's, what's your mission? What are you doing? What are you charged with doing? And so why don't, why don't we start with Karen? Okay, well, thank you for having me. It's nice to see some friendly faces in the audience this afternoon. So Cuyahoga County is the county that surrounds Cleveland, Ohio. Cleveland itself is a city that is a lot smaller than it used to be. Uh, think Detroit. Uh, we're at 400,000, and back in 1920, in the heyday of Cleveland, it was nearer to a million people. So we have infrastructure and arts and cultural infrastructure that was crafted at a time when we were a much bigger place than we are now. And, and that's a great context setter for the story of how is it that we have such robust public funding in Cleveland, Ohio, and our surrounding county. When you factor the county in, there are 59 suburban communities. It's about 1.2 million people. The MSA is about 2.5 million people if you stretch all the way down toward Akron and Canton and east toward Youngstown. Our community in the late 90s said, gosh, you know, we're smaller than we used to be. We really need to think more strategically about how we're funding this extraordinary arts and cultural ecosystem that we have. We should do some planning and figure out what this looks like. And so that was the genesis of a cultural plan in Cleveland for really the region of Northeast Ohio, not just our county. And that plan had four tenants in it, not unlike yours, that when you look at the language, they're very similar in some ways. The last one was, and I have to read it to you because it's sort of why I have a job, uh, goal four resources, develop financial and other resources to sustain and grow the arts and cultural sector, particularly public resources. Mm -hmm. At the time, we had 63 cents per capita of public investment in arts and culture, mm -hmm. which was, I think, at the very bottom nationwide, if it wasn't exactly the bottom. And for a city with such a rich cultural legacy, it was time to go find some public money. So there was a referendum, and we passed a cigarette tax, 30 cents per pack of cigarettes sold countywide. That generates about $15 million a year that may only be spent on arts and culture. Arts and culture has a wide definition in, in Cuyahoga County. It includes nature and science, humanities, media, lets us capture lots of different things. Mm -hmm. And our agency is known as a regional arts and cultural district. We're chartered by the state. We're not a unit of county or city government. And 95% of what we do is grant making. We take 5% administration out of that roughly $15 million a year worth of cigarette tax income. But the rest goes out in the form of public grants to organizations of all sizes and also to individual artists. Well, thanks. Joe? Uh, St. Paul is a city of about approaching about 300,000 people. Uh, we are, of course, known also to be tied to our, our neighbor, who we love and hate, uh, the city of <laughs> Minneapolis, which brings in at about 400,000 people. And as a metro, um, seven county metro, we're about 3 million, uh, 3 million people. In, in St. Paul, about 15 years ago, there was a move to, on, on the part of, I think then, uh, St. Paul Mayor Norm Coleman, to fund a convention center, and which, by the way, no relation to the guy I work for was Chris Coleman, uh, a lefty Democrat versus Norm Coleman, who um, was quite conservative. Norm was leading an effort to build a convention center and hockey arena. And in order to pay for that, uh, wanted to get uh, permission from the state to levy a local option sales tax of a half cent. And the political deal that was struck that, that authorized that local option sales tax required that uh, of the half cent, 10% of the net proceeds was to be spent on arts and culture nonprofits. And, uh, and so uh, the sales tax yields about 1.8 to 2 million dollars, I'm sorry, 18 to 20 million dollars a year. So we get 1.8 to, to 2 million dollars to fund our arts and culture nonprofits in the city of St. Paul. Um, that was initially set up to be a 25 year sunset, but we've been extending it and we're lobbying the state to extend it out to like 2055 right now. So, you know. The expectation is that we'll just 
keep continue to basically refinance that half cent sales tax so it will live in perpetuity at least so far as my career is concerned um, I'll leave it at that, I guess, for now. Sure, okay. Um, and then Chicago, and forgive me if I'm repeating extremely familiar uh, information to our local audience, um, but sometimes it helps to be reminded. We're a city of just under three million people. We're a region, depending on how many counties you want to include, of about nine million, kind of the uh, MSA or SMSA. Um, we are a cabinet level department um, and we're um, the successor of several different departments that were merged first in, as a result of the 86 cultural plan. There was a separate office on fine arts, there was a separate office of special events, separate film office. Um, so after the 86 plan, a cabinet level Department of Cultural Affairs was formed. Um, and then very recently, the Department of Cultural Affairs was merged with um, the Mayor's Office of Special Events. So we're still a cabinet level city department. Um, our budget, according to our 2011 annual report, which is online, you could take a look at that, is $37.7 million. Our grants are of $1.1 million. So I think, my, I'm really bad at math, but we're less than 60 cents per person, so we're worse than, yeah. than, than, than that measure. Um, and our source of funding is about 85% of our budget comes from a hotel motel tax, which is maybe something people weren't aware of. Um, we do get a little bit of state funding and a little bit of federal funding, um, so that, that's part of the mix. Um, our grants are, uh, again, as a result of the 86 cultural plan, our grant program was established. Um, and I believe it's at a very similar level dollar amount from when it was first established in the mid 80s. So that's the situation now. Um, so we do have a brand new cultural plan um, that came out and um, among many, many, many recommendations in there, there are recommendations to grow the um, amount of dollars that uh, goes to artists and to our grants program, and then also to encourage um, more modern grant making um, and a broader uh, basket of things that are actually funded by grants. The other big difference between our respective um, approaches is that we also uh, run and manage 12 different facilities. So the cultural center that you're in now, which is a cultural center because the 86 plan said, turn the old library into a municipal arts center. You know, we have the old, older plan to thank for that. Um, but we also do a lot of the programming and management in Millennium Park. We have several other facilities and buildings. We have a small historic house museum. So we have a lot of facilities in our portfolio as well. Um, so that's a little bit of a difference um, among us. I don't know if you have any comments to begin with well, just, about that. I just thought maybe I'd, I'd add a little bit about how we're structured. Um, I'm basically a one-man shop in St. Paul. There's no staff there. Um, there are people in, in various city departments that I, I work with to do everything as mundane as execute grants um, to we have an artist in residence program in our public works department. Um, and those things uh, are not included in, in the, the, the one and a half to two million dollars that we give away in grants, um, nor is our, our public art program. We have a, you know, it's a pretty standard percent for art program for our capital program in the city. Um, uh, but those things are all basically integrated into the departments. In St. Paul, we have uh, a strong mayor system, which which basically means uh, that all the department directors are appointed by and, and report to and serve at the pleasure of the mayor, as opposed to strong council systems where those individuals generally uh, report to the council president. Um, and so in, in, in my position, it's basically the mayor kind of invented the position that he wanted me to have and said, you know, go and go and do this, and I serve directly in the mayor's office, and we're not, we have, the way the city is st structured, basically, you've got the, the council, which is basically oversight, sets policy and oversight, 
And then the mayor has a staff of maybe 12 to 15, depending on the time, and then about 10 department directors that run uh, an employ uh, a workforce of about 3,000 people. So none of us in the mayor's office actually have anybody who work for us. Um, and we're, we're sort of, by design, constantly kind of bumping up against and agitating with the bureaucracy to implement various policy objectives. Mine is in arts and culture and vitality. We've got a sustainability coordinator who is you know, constantly bumping up against the bureaucracy for various policy things related to the environment. So um, it, it, I think as, as the three of us were speaking on the phone just to kind of talk about all of our jobs, it, we really have wildly different structures to, to work within. Yeah, ours is different even yet, and knowing this is being recorded for posterity, I'm, I'm not going to tell the whole story, but I encourage the audience to Google Cuyahoga County Corruption 2008-2007. Our agency was born after the referendum was passed in 2006, and it was born into this climate where there was very, very little trust in county government because of this big, big corruption scandal for which many people are now serving in prison. So part of why we were set up to be completely separate from city government or county government was to maintain some arm's length from mm -hmm. that and ensure that this referendum and the dollars that were generated by it were actually going to be able to be used for the purpose that they were intended. What that means is that I don't have a relationship with city government, with county government, per se. Mm -hmm. We're not a capital level department. Mm -hmm. and so. That just brings up other kinds of challenges. On the one hand, you have plenty of resources to work with. On the other hand, the integration becomes sort of an interesting question, and that's mm -hmm. one we wrestle with a lot. Well, something, Karen, that you mentioned um, kind of struck me was the 59 different municipalities in your service area, I guess, within the county. Um, and I wondered, you know, what's the relationship? Are you granting to only artists? Are you granting to any of those municipalities or sort of municipally placed arts projects that they're carrying out? The short answer to that is yes. Um, and I put some of our most recent annual reports on the back table that she can pick up on the way out if you're interested. There's a map on the inside of it that shows Cuyahoga County with some dots on it where programming takes place. We fund primarily organizations, 501c3 nonprofit organizations, um, many of them through an operating support program that has robust dollars attached to it. It's based on the size of your organization's budget. So our presenting Broadway theater can get a million and a half dollars a year. Um, a $200,000 nonprofit with staff can get $15,000, $20,000 a year, and that's still really meaningful for the size mm -hmm. of that organization. Most of those organizations are based in the city of Cleveland or in our cultural district, which is sort of a university circle just not far from, from downtown Cleveland itself. Most of those organizations are doing programming that's going out to all 59 communities mm -hmm. because Cleveland, like many older urban metro areas, there's a no, I don't want to go downtown thing that goes on, right? So there is stuff that happens in the urban core of Cleveland, but there's a lot of programming that happens in the suburbs, and we look to surface that. Mm -hmm. Through our project support program, we also do surface arts projects in unusual places, and that's where we really dig into the suburban neighborhoods, mm -hmm. which are all very different. Um, and we do fund units of government through that, so we will fund the city of Strongsville this year for some senior center arts programming, that mm -hmm. kind of yeah. thing. Um, and then individual artists as well that we fund through a C3 that actually tackles that work for us. So mm -hmm. the geographic imprint is a big question for us. How do we make sure that everybody in the county sees themselves in this tax mm -hmm. and that they don't see it as a tax for the arts community? They see it as it reflects in our mission as a, a an investment that strengthens the community at large. Mm -hmm. You know, interestingly, you're both funded by a tax measure mm -hmm. that goes directly to arts and culture. It's actually something that's suggested in the cultural plan, our cultural plan, to have some kind of dedicated tax for arts and culture, which was met with um, an extreme amount of skepticism, I would say, um, pretty widely and in the press in particular. And, um, you know, we've looked at other places <laughs> as best practices. And so um, and we've been telling people they do it in other cities, and it's really successful, and it's voter-supported, and it's the people who vote for it, and it's the people who want it. And I wondered if you could talk, both, both of you, a little bit about sort of how did you, how did that come about? What was the, um, the mechanism for that popular support? Was it, was it an, an initiative that came from the people um, or the prior mayor or, or what have you? 
Well, in, in St. Paul, I think I, I want to reference two things. Um, first of all, just two, two years ago, uh, the state of Minnesota had a referendum um, we call, we affectionately call our, our legacy amendment. And the, the proper name is much more long and uh, boring than that. But what it does is basically funds um, uh, hunting and fishing, conservation, and arts and culture, all very broadly defined. Um, but that passed with, I, I want to say, over 60% of the vote. And, and, is, and effectively tripled the amount of state funding for the arts. So these kinds of ballot initiatives uh, can be very successful. Now I'll tell, you, I'll tell you, this is a very sophisticated campaign that was run, and and you know we we as an arts community kind of jumped in bed with the with the uh, environment community and, and hunting and fishing community. So all three sort of wildly different cultures. Um, but very effective and very powerful in persuading the voters of the state to, um, to make a meaningful commitment over time to what is, I think, at least by those of us from Minnesota, really the, 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 the identity and, and legacy of our state. Now, the half cent sales tax that, that goes to fund the arts organizations just in St. Paul was basically um, having a well-placed state senator on the finance committee who is a champion for the arts and, and perhaps uh, could accurately be described as a skeptic for uh, the convention project. Didn't want to be an absolute roadblock, but wanted to make sure that something was in it for the things he found important in his constituents. Also, as a part of that deal, the arts were just, you know, again, when you think about 10% of a half cent sales tax, um, it really wasn't a lightning rod. He was basically able to um, get that in through the strength and authority of his position he held in the Senate, in the state Senate. Um, uh, but also a significant percentage, I think uh, another 30 to 40 percent, and it's a more flexible formula, but um, go to support economic development initiatives in the neighborhoods. So things like storefront improvements and, and um, you know, uh, commercial corridors and those kinds of efforts are also funded from this same half cent sales tax. And so it was similarly to the, to the referendum I just described, three different interests sort of pooling together around uh, a, a, a sharing of a dedicated source of funding. That, that idea of different kinds of folks coming together to support a referendum is, is very much part of the story in Cleveland, though um, we had a different outcome for a couple of different reasons. I think any community that's looking at earmarked dedicated taxes for arts and culture, you've got to pick what works in your neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things to know about Cleveland is that the early part of the 1990s, we built a whole bunch of stadiums, a new baseball stadium, a new football stadium, et cetera, et cetera. Cleveland has used sin taxes to pay for that sort of thing forever. We have, we have said, let's tax alcohol, let's tax cigarettes to fund civic priorities. So when the folks who've been through our cultural planning process in the late 90s turned their attention to how do we find some resources, um, they knew that they might have some buckets of what they call permissive taxes to work with. Now the climate in Ohio has actually changed since our referendum was passed and these things are not as available today as mm -hmm. they were back in 2006. Mm -hmm. But the process to go from a cultural plan to the referendum was a six, seven, eight year process mm -hmm. and there were three tries at it. Uh, there was a try at the ballot that was more economic development oriented and it was a little bit unclear where the money was going to come from and that that did not succeed. There was a concerted effort driven by the arts and cultural community to see if there was a percent of property tax that would make sense. Mm -hmm. um, and if, I don't know about here, but certainly in Ohio property tax is like the third rail, right? It's yeah. just, it, they're high enough, it's really hard to think about uh, property tax as a good vehicle. Yeah. But then we have this history of using sin taxes, we have uh, you know, a big, big enough population. We found a commodity item to work with that, frankly, has a moderately inelastic demand. Mm -hmm. So it's something that people do, right? Mm -hmm. You know, we're driving, we're, we're driving down the smoking rate. Is one of the things right. we like to say. The smoking rate is lower in Cuyahoga County than it is in the rest of the state. A lot of that is because the Cleveland Clinic is based with us, and they work really <laughs> hard at at smoking cessation. Right. But we're a little piece of that. But it wasn't, the other piece that's very similar to your story, Joe, is that it was not just the arts and culture community that did this work. 
Yes, the arts and cultural community drove it, and there were curtain speeches, and there were all kinds of artists and folks. This was before my time when this happened. Mm -hmm. But arts and culture worked with organized labor. Arts and culture worked with the education community. Arts and culture worked with as many different folks as they could find to say, if you care about quality of life in this community, here's a quality of life type tax. We didn't call it that. Mm -hmm. But it was clear that these dollars would go to support the quality of life things and arts education oriented things that the mm -hmm. community really wanted. Mm -hmm. So I think while the mechanism is gonna be different in every community, I think a critical success factor is work with folks that go beyond just the arts and culture community. Mm -hmm. That's great advice. Um, so this, if you guys haven't seen this, pick this up in the back. This is the, um, the report that Karen brought and um, I wanted to ask uh, each of you guys a little bit about metrics and about data and measurement and research. Um, it's something actually through our DCASE strategic plan process, which we're in the middle of this department-wide strategic plan process, which is something that's called for in the cultural plan, so we're working on that. But part of what um, every unit is grappling with is metrics. How, how, what is the best way to measure what we're doing and how do, can we build that into the um, sort of the day-to-day -day work and our systems for our work? Um, which is which is complicated business for sure and, and very tricky business and so I wondered if um, each of you could talk a little bit about you know what are you charged with accomplishing and how do you measure that um, and, and what are just some of those tools for measurement and obviously measurement has a huge role in advocacy um, and it would be great to hear a little bit about about that know if you want to yeah I, if you look at the, the report itself is based on data that comes from the cultural data project I believe they do that in Illinois we have that in Illinois yeah, yeah. so it's a national project for capturing financial data and, and participation data for arts and cultural organizations and what that represents for us is primarily output mm. uh, we were founded so the referendum passes in 2006 the agency is built in 2007. We make our first grant at the very beginning of 2008. We are youngsters. And I joined actually in, in February of 2010. And our first work when I joined was really what I'd call about operational performance. Let's get them, make sure the grant programs are working the way we think they ought to work. Let's make sure everything is happening the way we think it ought to. And we're absolutely there now. Um, your commissioner has been a panelist with us a couple of times and, okay. and uh, knows our process. And it, it, it's pretty straightforward at this point. I think we're doing the work the way the work needs to be done. But we are now turning our attention to questions that go just beyond outputs. That report talks about nearly $300 million worth of economic activity related to mm. the organizations that we fund, 8,700 jobs in the community, which is actually more than Ford or GM in Cleveland right now, and that's saying a little something wow. about arts and culture and our economy. Wow. But that's not impact per se. Mm -hmm. That's not this question of what are we charged with accomplishing. And that's the work that our board is actually turning its attention to right now. And before we got going this afternoon, we were talking about, does your community have a strategic plan? What's the community trying to do? And where does arts and culture fit into that? And we are just beginning to wrestle with not only what the issues are the community is tackling with, but how we can do something that will be measurable, that will help us say, yes, the presence of these dollars certainly supported great organizations and great artists, but here's how it made a difference for the community. Mm -hmm. so, so ask me again in a couple of years how Fair we enough. do that. <laughs> Fair enough. I bet you have a stronger answer though because you guys have been at this a little bit longer, huh? Well, it's, yeah, it's, um, it's funny, you know, one of my charges, well, I mean, the, the job is to serve the mayor and, and make him look good in many, many ways. Um, um, and, and I'll say that, uh, I, I, I wasted about two years in my job. I came with, in with the mayor in, in uh, January 2006. Um, and I wasted about two years trying to make everybody happy. And, um, you know, finally I just, I, I said, you know what, I'm just going to be absolutely, you know, direct and, and kind of aggressive about what we're, what we're trying to do. But let me back up. The mayor, in my interview uh, to, for the job, basically said, I want you to make I want you to make St. Paul cool. St. Paul has long suffered from a reputation where we are dead at night, or um, in see, insert you know, your humorous metaphor where the, the sidewalks roll up at six o'clock or tumbleweed drifts down the street. Um, and so to some extent, we use data, I use data more as a, as a 
as a way to inform our strategies and also make the case for why it's important. So with this, with this um, backdrop of, of a long-suffering reputation at hand, uh, our 2006 economic impact study that we did with uh, Minnesota Citizens for the Arts and Americans for the Arts showed actually similar numbers to what you just described. Um, I think it was we had almost 5,000 jobs, a $310 million economic um, impact, or rather economic activity. Um, but the big number that I latched onto, which are, I mean, those are important, those are impressive as economic sectors for a community our size. And I don't want to downplay the importance. But where I got a lot more mileage is out of the fact that St. Paul arts and culture nonprofits draw five and a half million visitors a year. Yeah. What was significant about that is Minneapolis did the same study that same year. And I would do, I would go out and, and, and meet with folks and I would say, and how many do you think Minneapolis drew? If we're drawing five and a half million. And everybody was guessing, you know, 50 million, 100 million. Their number is 4.9 million. Which is not to say that we're so much greater than Minneapolis. I love both cities, my home is about three quarters of a mile from the, the city line directly between both downtowns. Um, but what it does suggest is that this reputation was somehow misplaced. And, and what, what I used that to do is basically form our strategies, which is looking at who are we drawing. We do kids and families in St. Paul very, very well. We've got a, a sort of a, a gold standard children's museum. We have a science museum that exports um, two major exhibits to the sort of the, 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 the museum community each, each year. Um, and we have a history museum that's very well funded and very sophisticated. We do kids and families really well. And we have more theater seats per capita than anywhere outside of uh, New York City. We have really rich professional theater companies. Um, but their audiences all tend to um, trend toward the 55 and older set. And what we're missing are the folks who like to stay out past 11. And, um, and so we've made a really specific, and that's what the mayor said. I mean, he didn't really have the data behind it. It was sort of a gut feeling, make St. Paul cool. But it was make St. Paul attractive to younger audiences, to people in their 20s and 30s. And, and uh, we focus our efforts a lot on live music because A, that's a very effective medium to draw those audiences. Um, and we also, by the way, take a look at um, you know, things like uh, poetry slams and, and things that I describe as having like a rock and roll sensibility. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be music, but using that as kind of a tone setter. Um, and the other reason is because Mayor Chris Coleman has a personal passion for live music and he wants to have more places to go see music in his hometown. And I guess that really has really informed, I think, my, uh, my kind of reaction to the whole concept of arts planning and, you know, really what it comes down to is do you have the will among your decision makers to implement these things? Mm -hmm. And so many of these plans really do is they make the case, um, but at the end of the day it really requires the will of the decision makers, um, which can be informed, of course, by the will of the people <laughs> uh, in, in the ideal concept of a re representative democracy. Um, but I'll say that I measure our progress more by what the media says about our city. You know, when in, in 2007 there was uh, a story, um, a front page story in our local, with St. Paul Pioneer Press, nightlife in downtown St. Paul, is it gone forever? Wow. And I thought, thanks hometown paper. <laughs> Um, and that's when I decided, like, wow, I've wasted, you know, almost two years trying to make all these arts organizations and arts administrators happy. I've got a specific job to do, and I've clearly failed because this is what the headline in the paper is. Um, so I got a lot more, you know, like I said, a lot more aggressive about what we were trying to do. And two years later, um, there was a, a front page story in the Star and Tribune that, that described uh, Lower Town, which is a, a half downtown as the new cool kid in the, in, in the Twin Cities nice. and, and as the, and the Pioneer Press had another front page story that described it as the new hotspot in the Twin Cities. So um, the media can be fickle, but certainly 
What that did though to change the marketplace, if you're talking to a business owner or a nonprofit uh, director who's looking to cite their business or their nonprofit, having media that plays toward those advantages or disadvantages, I have found has a huge impact in what a particular corner of your city looks like. It, it, make, it makes or breaks it, in, in my opinion. So I measure predominantly with what does the media say? Oh, that's really interesting. And just for some context, Chicago's most recent stats for tourism, we draw um, a little over 43 million visitors a year. So just a, a different level of magnitude for sure as regards tourism. But what, um, where there's room for growth is only about, I can't remember if it's 1% or 1 million, I'm sorry about not remembering the stats, but um, overseas visitors. Mm -hmm. So we don't do that strong of a job um, drawing overseas visitors, but we know that overseas visitors who come here love it. <laughs> and so there's a lot of, um, and just anecdotal and research, that there's a lot of room for growth in the overseas visitor market, um, which is part of turning, you know, having Chicago be a stronger global destination. Arts and culture is a big part of that, um, the asset we have that we can um, use for that kind of economic growth. Um, so that's the, uh, the tourism piece and sort of that room for growth. I wanted to um, ask a little bit about, we just touched upon this really recently. Well, I thought what you said about um, the, the popular support creating the political will or maybe sort of the institutional support for that. Um, that's certainly been my experience in all of last year when we did this sort of very broad and very deep public process for the cultural plan. Um, and we've heard this uh, enormously positive um, popular support for arts and culture, a really um, great level of engagement um, talking about arts and culture during our cultural plan process and a very resounding number one priority is arts education. And leadership saw that and jumped in and said, oh, we'll, we will create an arts ed plan for CPS, the first ever. Um, and it gained enormous amount of momentum sort of the rest of that whole year. And they kind of caught up with us, and we released our plan with, with the beginnings of their plan. And their plan will, final plan will get released in the next month or so. Um, so I've seen that momentum kind of carry through to our sister city agencies and sister city departments. Um, where astonishingly and wonderfully other city departments are saying we went through the cultural plan and we did a staff retreat and looked through and found everything that relates to our department and we're ready to work with you, right? Uh, astonishing, really um, uh, fantastic. Um, and really that whole year of process has created that will. Um, and now we're engaging in very deep um, conversations about near-term opportunities and long-term planning and collaboration. Um, and I wanted to ask you about your sort of interagency and intergovernmental um, cooperation. I mean, this is the will of the mayor, you know, and so the mandate is there um, for uh, the, the city to respond to this need to, to attract um, this a certain population, certain businesses. And I, I wondered what your um, what the landscape is for you. Well, it's 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 interesting. You know, a, a lot of it is. A lot of my work is not necessarily reaching out to other units of government, um, but rather making sure that that the city council, that we've got strong support with the city council, we're being responsive to their interests and their needs as well. Um, occasionally there is some um, uh, intersection with our, our school district, which um, in St. Paul is, is still quite separate, but um, and, and whereas I do have a, a very deep personal passion around arts education, uh, the district has their own arts director, and um, her name, interestingly, is Jan Spencer. No relation to me, but um, she and I work together, but more as a, a matter of um, you know, we've just known each other a long time and want to. As a matter, of, a matter of curiosity, know what each other is up to, um, but my work again, predominantly um, around driving vitality and street life, doesn't really intersect mm -hmm. with arts education very often. And in fact, 
Um, I, I have to admit, we probably have a bias against arts education in terms of our granting. Um, you know, we're really, really specifically targeted at, at bringing people into downtown. Um, and so when, when there are arts, arts education projects, they really have to make the case that they are going to either significantly increase the capacity of arts, an arts organization or through its programming somehow result in more family visits or individual visits into, into St. Paul. The way it's working in Cleveland right now is a, is a little bit different than that. Um, we have several uh, political subdivisions, organizations that are structured like we are, our park system countywide, mm -hmm. our county library system, mm -hmm. our court authority. Mm -hmm. um, and all of those institutions, with the exception of the county library, go back to the ballot with a referendum to mm -hmm. keep them funded. Sometimes it's property tax, sometimes right. it's other kinds of things. Levies are, again, this is a hyper-local question for Cleveland, levies are how we do it. It's how we continue to pay for civic priorities. So one of my priorities and our agency's priorities has been to make sure we make good friends with all of these other organizations that are getting back out to the ballot. Because we're all, one way or another, dealing with mm -hmm. quality of life stuff. Mm -hmm. and. Um, the folks at the Community Partnership for Arts and Culture, which is an arts service organization in Cleveland, they spend a lot of time trying to, time trying to help arts and culture organizations find their way and, and to be part of the broader civic landscape conversation. So we just did a big referendum to help fund the Cleveland Public Schools. And arts and culture got behind that, put money into the campaign, mm -hmm. ads in the program book, had the orchestra, curtain speeches about this is really important. You know, the, the, the community comes together and says, hey, we as a cultural community should be part of this conversation. And okay, it's gonna be quid pro quo, right? When it comes time for us to go back to the ballot in 2015, we want to make sure that we have made strong enough connections with the rest of the community that everybody will do the same for us as we've done for them. That's how it worked in 2006. Mm -hmm. The challenge is keeping the arts and cultural community focused on these other community priorities mm -hmm. at a time when we're still living out our ballot initiative. Mm -hmm. If we don't stay engaged, the advocacy work that came out of the cultural plan, you know, it can fade away a little mm -hmm. bit and you don't want to have to start that from zero. So. So I just have a quick follow-up question about, I mean, it, as, the, as the people who, as the number of people who smoke diminishes, mm -hmm. is there a danger of your, well, this is, this is the problem yeah, yeah. with taxes that are tied to a certain thing. I mean, yeah. that is it going to shrink or then would you go back and say, well, we're, we're going to do not a 30 cent tax, but it needs to be an 80 cent tax. Right the next time you go back. Yeah, anybody who's doing sales tax has the same question, right? When the economy drops and people stop spending, the sales tax that was generated isn't what it once was. Pittsburgh has a very similar model to yours, Joe, and uh, their um, regional asset district couldn't make the kind of investments in arts and culture because they just didn't have the revenue. Mm -hmm. This source was designed from the beginning, knowing that if we did this right, people would smoke less and oh. there would be less revenue over time. There is a place where it plateaus, and we don't quite know where that is yet. Um, the first year this tax was generated, it generated almost $20 million. Mm -hmm. And it's been on a, little, on a decline since the beginning. We thought it was gonna decline between six and a half and 7% a year, mm -hmm. and it hasn't. Okay. It's been much more, uh, a much slower decline. So it's still relatively predictable for us as an agency, so we can look into the future and say, all else equal, unless there's a statewide uh, tax increase or a federal tax increase, we should be able to maintain a moderate level of grant making. Mm -hmm. um, what we can't do is increase the amount of tax. We're known as, we're, we're at the top of the millage, as they ah. say, in tax, in, okay. in, the, in the tax world. So 30 cents a pack is all we can do. Okay. So then what we have to look at is, do we want to expand our reach a little bit? We are just taxing cigarettes. What would happen if we taxed all tobacco products as well? Uh, what does that look like? Uh -huh. Do we want to consider other kinds of things? There's certainly the, the health uh, moves talking about obesity and soda and do we want to tax that kind of stuff? Uh. It's a tricky time to be talking about taxes if you've been paying attention to politics lately, right? And uh, right now we are not so anxious to open up our authorizing legislation so that someone might decide that it shouldn't exist at all anymore. Mm -hmm. So the strategy for 2015 when we go back to the ballot will be let's renew the tax that we have. Uh -huh. But we're always keeping our eyes open for that, that senator who is thinking about another way to pull some additional dollars that could be earmarked for perhaps just arts education or those other kind of things. So, Sure. 
Um, and I, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, kind of the undercurrent, I think, in both of what you're talking about is the economy and economic development. And I'm just picturing your mayor reading Richard Florida's book and saying, you know, we need to make St. Paul cool. Um, I don't know that that happened, but it may well have been that path to that um, revolution. Michigan had the cool cities, Michigan, which was kind of like influenced by that Richard Florida um, sensibility and people really getting it, actually. Um, and your metrics really do, you know, you have the ROI. Um, and for sure, um, n not so heavily discussed impl explicitly in our cultural planning process, but implicit, you know, with our mayor's transition plan is strengthening the economy, growing the creative industries, you know, having more economic opportunity for immigrants and for the young creatives who come here that they would stay here and build their career here. So there is a lot of talk about um, the economic aspects of the arts. I think, um, I'm, I'm trying to remember the quote, um, it might have been um, my counterpart in 86, quoting that the arts is never funded only for the arts alone, Michael Dorff. You know, there's always something else that they're looking to get out of arts funding. And um, maybe if we could talk a little bit about economic impact and, um, or just sort of the creative economy sensibility. Well, I, I first have to, to say that I have, it has come out recently, this sort of this mission of making the city cool, but I really tried to keep that under wraps for a long time because it's sort of like your mom and dad trying to be cool. Like, it's just, once they say it, just you're doomed for dorkdom, you know, from there on out. Um, and, and, I, and I think also the, the Mayor Coleman's ideas around, around making the city more vibrant and having a downtown with more street life and vitality wasn't so much tied to, to Richard Florida, who I've always sort of, I sort of appreciate it, but it, it's always come off as a bit flaky to me. Um, uh, more, more to the point though is how do you want your city to feel? And, and uh, if, if you walk down the street and there's nobody around, feels crappy. And at the same time, when you go down the street and there are hundreds of thousands of people around, it feels great. And, and it's not even that it's, it's more anecdotal and more of a, we just, I was just in a meeting yesterday, we had a, can I take a little tangent? The, we had, there was a store called Dayton's, was your equivalent of a, a Marshall Fields, right? And, and then um, they gave birth to Target. Target has gone on to be, you know, Target. And, and then Dayton's was bought by Marshall Fields and then like yours now is, Macy's and our downtown Macy's was just, you know, you may as well just slap a coal sign on it and call it a day. It was the crappiest, most, you know, the, the store was absolutely disinvested in by the company. Um, and they recently announced that they're closing. Surprise, surprise. Um, and the, the, there's an interesting debate that's going to be ahead of us. God, I hope this video doesn't get out. YouTube, my friend. Measure Sorry. your words. <laughs> Measure your words. Well, there's a certain amount of the preservation community that's going to advocate strongly that the building be deemed historic, even though it's not registered now. Because it was designed by the guy who designed Southdale Mall in, in Minneapolis, which was the first indoor shopping mall. So I basically want to pay homage to the guy who began the destruction of urban retail in America. <laughs> and what better homage than an empty retail store in downtown? <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, anyway, so we are having this conversation yesterday about how do we market Wabasha, the street that it's on, so that uh, we have a, the kind of robust redevelopment of that site that we'd like to see. And as we were talking about it, we had our planning and economic development staff in, and I was in the meeting, and, and sort of debating different points. And at one point, the mayor just said, you know, we can't look to a market analysis to figure this out. At some point, we've got to effectively curate what we want to have happen on this site. And we're going to do that with a gut feeling about what we want our city to look and feel like. But, the, but the, the, the payoff comes when we are courting this um, 
uh, this company called Cray Computers. They're based out of S Seattle, and they wanted to put another headquarters in the Midwest. And we were competing against other markets, and 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 um, their their potential site was right on a park that we we call Mears Park. And the day of their visit, everything went wrong. Their CEO came through, and there was a. A, like a 36 hour rainstorm that yielded two and a half inches of rain. The ceiling was leaking. There ended up to be some vagrant who bumped like in the hall of this complex asking him for money. Like <laughs> it, it was a disaster of a site visit. But throughout the day the, the rain subsided and they walked out at the, at the end of the day out onto the park and it was the first night of our jazz festival. And Alan Toussaint was playing in the park. We had about 6,000 people out. We'd opened two new bars recently um, right, right there. And it was the kind of place that feels awesome. And the CEO turned to the mayor and he said, I'm not sure you would have had me, but this is what my employees want, and this is what's going to allow me to attract the kind of talent I need to run my company. Mm -hmm. I'm moving here. That's great. And you know, there's not necessarily a huge trend line of data, but there are enough stories like that yeah. that keep us believing in this as an effective strategy. And again, it's not for that guy necessarily. It's because we want our city to feel awesome, mm -hmm. and yeah. so we're going to try to make the kind of moves that make it feel the way we want it to feel. Right. I mean, you're talking about vibrancy, right? Cultural vibrancy, community vitality, which are not so easy to measure always and how to quantify that. Um, how about you? Any yeah, it's interesting because it, it's very much this question of how do you want it to feel, right? Mm -hmm. We all can come up with great economic impact statistics, right? <laughs> and they work really well with folks who might not be connected to the arts community to help folks say, oh, there's something here I should be paying attention to. There's something good here when you talk about jobs and you talk about education and you talk about all these things. But what it comes down to is really core to what our mission is about strengthening community, right? So I was just this past week, our art museum, a venerable 100-year-old institution, has made a foray onto the other side of town. Cleveland is a town split by a river that you might have heard of, did something a few years ago in the environmental world. We won't talk about that. Um, but people don't cross the river. You're an east sider or you're a west sider, but you don't cross. That just doesn't happen, especially if you're in the museum campus on the east side, right? Don't ask me why this is. We crossed it all the time when I was a kid, but that's unusual. So the art museum with an, an independent investor and art collector took a power transformer station and it made front page news in the plane dealer the other day, turned it into an art installation on the other side of town. Mm -hmm. So there's private money in it. It's in a, a neighborhood called Ohio City that has gone through all kinds of rebirth over the years. But when we were at the opening the other night, it's spectacular space, the art's amazing, right? Feels very different, feels like an urban community, which not all of Cleveland does. It's cool, can I it's say it? It's very cool. cool. It's yeah. very cool. Come and check it out. There's lots of cool things in Cleveland you must come see. And not in a mom-dad kind of way. No, not in a mom-dad kind of way at all. And we know how to eat in Cleveland. Then you think you know how to eat here? Oh, wait till you come to Cleveland, I'll oh, just say. Oh, man, gauntlet yeah. thrown. Absolutely. Okay. So but I was talking to the city councilman at the opening, and, and he's telling me, not only does it feel good and it's cool and there's a Saturday night and there's life, you know, all kinds of liveliness around it, that block has now been transformed. Crime has dropped significantly. Because mm -hmm. across the street from the transformer station, somebody bought another building and put in a coffee shop. Mm -hmm. And that same developer, not a developer, a guy who bought it and wants to make his neighborhood better, is doing something with a different building and changing the structure of the tenants who were in there and trying to just bring the level of it up a little bit. Suddenly, this pocket of Cleveland is where you want to be. The Gordon Square Arts District, 20 blocks west of there, is a pocket of Cleveland you want to be in because of how it feels. And yes, the economic impact is tremendous, but how it feels for the city is even better. Mm -hmm. Our challenge is how we do that for our county with 59 communities. Right. In. I don't know the answer to that yet, but we right. will go one neighborhood one at neighborhood a time. One neighborhood at a time, yeah. I think, is good. <laughs> right. How are we doing on time, Betty? OK, good. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's I think what we're finding um, over a long history of doing, especially kind of large scale temporary art projects in spaces that are um, unexpected, 
is that they do have the power to transform um, people's experience in that place and have a little bit of lasting um, impact, right, in changing people's minds. Um, I wonder if what rec what advice and recommendations you have for Chicago. Um, you know, we just did this big cultural plan, and we're looking at um, a lot of a lot of changes that have come. We have a very um, you know, like everyone, a challenging economy. We're all in the Midwest, so I think that that our rebound has kind of um, been more sluggish than the coast is kind of what I'm hearing. Um, and I know that there's a different um, sense of, do you, you know, wh what is the value of having the cultural plan or not having it? Um, it sounds like it was instrumental, you know, for your process and um, maybe not the way you would go in, in um, St. Paul. I wondered if you have advice for us. Advice for Chicago. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, guess a, I guess a couple of things. Um, we have a lot of money. Let's just make that really clear. Money is not the answer in and of itself. Money's a means to an end. And figuring out what the end is that you want, that's the work. And I think through this planning process, you guys have a sense of the end that you're looking for. So now the question is how do you resource it? How do you find some of those dedicated resources to really help make that stuff a reality? Mm -hmm. uh, and my advice there is don't copy our model. Mm -hmm. Figure out what works here. Mm -hmm. it, maybe cigarettes do work here. I don't have the foggiest idea. Smart people in places like the University of Chicago could probably tell you. Uh, th there are <laughs> cultural economists out there that could give you some great right. ideas. Um, just because it works for us doesn't necessarily mean it will work for you. And just because we have a bunch of it doesn't mean we've figured out the end yet. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. think that's the piece that, that our agency is pushing toward. It's more than just having money and handing it out. It's making sure that there's some real strength in the community that comes from it. Mm -hmm. um, the, the process of cultural planning is critically important. You've got all this momentum. You get all these people involved. And then how do you keep it going mm -hmm. at, at a level that people feel that they can still see something, I think, is a real question. And mm -hmm. I guess I would encourage everybody involved to not let your foot off the gas on keeping the community engaged. Let make sure that there are things happening that people can see and point to and say, oh, look, that was part of the plan. I said that, and it happened, right? Mm -hmm. and, and that's easier said than done. So. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and just, so, just for also comparison's sake, our state has had so many cigarette taxes that a pack of cigarette costs about 10 or $11 oh, yeah. in Chicago, because there have been many, many, there have been many, many dollar a pack. Taxes, so tax, you know, yeah. that in particular has been has been sought after and, and done, not for the arts, but just yeah. you know. At, yeah. In Cleveland, I think I'm not a smoker, but I, I think they're about six and a half dollars a pack. Yeah, and and we knew that. I mean, our state tax is really low, our local option tax is high, but everything else is on the lower side. So right. Joe, any advice for Chicago? Well, I mean, that <laughs> I, it feels like I'm too getting too big for my britches if I'm giving Chicago advice on what to do with their arts plan. But I guess I would say I, I, I spent quite a bit of time with it today, and um, it does a great job of kind of laying out a case and, 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 there's, and also identifying resources and, and, and needs. But I think you need leadership to pick what you're going to do. There's mm -hmm. something like 300 different initiatives. 241. All right. Ah. <laughs> who's counting? So, but who's counting? Who's keeping track? I'm keeping track. <laughs> you know, and, and even was it 10 different priorities? Um, can you have 100 priorities or right. even 10 right. for that matter? I yeah. think, yeah. you know, f from what I've experienced, I feel like you've got to pick one thing and drive at it. And maybe with the staff and, and, and the, the, the legacy of, of, of what you've got to work with, maybe it's three, but it's not 241. Mm -hmm. and, 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 if, and whether it's more, you know, we're gonna produce, make it aspirational, 500, 1,000, 5,000 units of live work space affordable for, for artists using federal, you know, affordable housing tax credits or, um, or some other sort of dedicated, you know, piece. Mm -hmm. I think you you identified another source for live work units. I, I noticed, but but whatever it is, pick that thing that will likely cross over and benefit the other 240 aspirations mm -hmm. in that 
and that plan, but, but pick the thing and then talk about it over and over and over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. Crank up the propaganda machine and, and let that thing fly. And when you say it over and over and over and over again, it becomes an expected reality. Mm -hmm. I think the thing that I um, caution you about is now having solicited yeah. thousands and thousands of people who all see themselves now in this plan there, they, there, there is, or there, I expect there will be an expectation from them, it's going to happen now. I went to all these meetings, I spent hours of my time, and I got this in the plan, so it's gonna happen. Mm -hmm. And in two years, when the phone rings, hey, why in the hell hasn't my thing happened? Mm -hmm. I was there, you said you were gonna do it, how come you haven't done it? And that very, that sort of consumer yeah. uh, attitude about yeah. what, what is going to happen can creep in quite quickly. Mm -hmm. My experience, I came in just after a, a similar plan was created and um, there was a lot of political pressure. I, I literally, 10 calls a day, what are you gonna do to implement the plan? And I'd been a part of the planning team and I, I was kind of skeptical about it. But there was a lot of pressure and I wanted to be responsive. I was new at the job, I was kind of been over my head so I wanted to do something for these people. And one day, I, I read it front to back, flipped it over, read it front to back, flipped it over, front to back. I, I don't know what these people want. Yeah. Okay. And because they, they wanted more revenue. Well, where in the hell do you see more revenue? Mm -hmm. we're, we're in a devastating budget crisis right now. There's no revenue right now. What are we going to do? We're going to more? We're going to try to protect what we have. Yeah, right. Um, and then finally I noticed on the cover of this vision, who I think we used the same outfit that you all did. The, Lord. Yeah. Lord Cultural Resources. Yeah. yeah. Um, it said, Arts, Culture, and Entertainment, a vision for St. Paul. And I said, oh, it's not a plan, it's a, a vision. vision. <laughs> <laughs> it's up to us to really sort of make a strategy about how we're going to go forward right. and, and touch on all these different things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's good. Maybe with that, we'll open it up for questions. Um, if you raise your hand, we'll recognize you and I'll repeat the question. The hand, I see one hand, so you got it. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm curious, um, with, with the community you're serving, sort of how um, you know, multiple sources of arts funding are, 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 are negotiated. In, 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 in the Cuyahoga County situation, you guys might be the 300 pound gorilla in, 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 in the room to still, to still work with other institutions uh, and other providers of arts to your, to your larger community and, and within, you know, in St. Paul, you know, you've got, you've got the Minnesota State Times, you've got what's going on over um, across, across the way in Minneapolis and kind of wondering about, um, you know, sort of how that, how that is negotiated by your organization and other organizations in response to um, sort of, you know, what's available in these larger metro areas from a variety of funding sources. All right, so I'm going to try to restate that and say, um, and, and maybe, I, I hope I don't change it too much, I'm going to change a little bit, but um, it made me think that, um, so how do you sort of combine and negotiate the different sources of arts funding, you and who else? I'll, I'm going to give a brief answer for us, right? So um, Illinois Arts Council is a big funder of the arts in the whole state of Illinois, and Chicago gets a lot of that because a lot of the arts organizations and artists are in Chicago. So there are other sources, particularly because our granting dollars are, are pretty small. Um, and I believe, I'm, I'm gonna get this wrong, I think, but the Illinois Arts Council annual grant budget is somewhere between 23 and 29 million, am I right? Well, it's in that magnitude, I hope, I, that is in, the, is in the ballpark, I hope. Um, so, you know, there, there's that as well in the mix in Chicago. And then, of course, philanthropy. We haven't mm -hmm. talked about philanthropy nice. at all. And there are things in Minnesota like the Knight Foundation, which is funding individual artists to an, a very strong degree and is the envy of every state. You know, it's incredible what they're doing. We have MacArthur here, we have Boeing. So philanthropy is a huge part of the mix as well. I wonder if there's been any shift share, you know, like what economists call shift share. 
when you got your tax and you sort of started to pump $15 million a year into the county, did everyone else say, like, ooh, we don't need to fund that anymore? You know, the foundations all of a sudden are like, oh, you're taken care of. We don't need to do maybe quite so much. I wonder if you could talk about that no, a little. It's a great point. And, and another one of the critical success factors in Cleveland was that the uh, foundation community, which is essentially our community foundation, which is one of the oldest in the country, and the George Gunn Foundation, since he, they, the guns made their home in Cleveland for a long time, those two funded the cultural plan. Those two uh -huh. said, we're not going to be able to sustain our own level of giving if somebody else doesn't come to oh. the table. So, so we were born into a system that already there was pretty significant foundation support for arts and culture in the community, and there was a commitment from those foundations that they weren't going to ratchet back once we came online. Now, if you remember the timeline, we made our first grants in 2008, and the economy kind of did something else in 2008. So we don't actually have good data that, mm -hmm. that will prove or disprove, did we crowd out other funding from foundations? The timing is just funny that way. Um, the place where, we're, where we do see some concern uh, is on the, on the corporate side. Um, mm. We still have strong individual philanthropy in Cleveland, though Cleveland has always been more driven by institutions. Uh, John D. Rockefeller was in Cleveland for a long time, early in his career, but the era of those sorts of philanthropists is 100 years old, like in most cities, but there wasn't the replacement of that group of folks mm -hmm. in Cleveland, because it's just a smaller place. So. Um, Institutional funding has always been really important as corporations' headquarters left, corporate dollars yeah. left. I wonder about the crowding out with the corporate sector. There are some tremendous corporations in Cleveland doing great, great work. We have a big presence of PNC Bank there and Grove Great and all of that stuff. Um, but I, I do think it's something we have to be mindful of, and it's something that whenever we're talking about it, we say, you know, this is an ecosystem and it's a funding ecosystem too. It can't be just private. Mm -hmm. It can't be just public. It's got to be a partnership or we can't sustain this ecosystem that's here. And, and not just sustain it, help it thrive, help it get to the next place, really take care of those emerging artists and organizations that are coming out of the woodwork as Cleveland reinvents itself. So mm -hmm. it's a great question to always be asking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we've got we've got you know as I've described kind of our own funding agenda and, and our goals and priorities are different from that of the foundation community. We we have I, I think probably the most generous foundation community in the country in in the Twin Cities in Minneapolis and St. Paul between you know McKnight and um, which is which is huge. Basically, it's 3M money and then and then um, I don't even. Oh, does Target Foundation maybe play a big role too? Target. Um, Are they more national? Did no. Oh. Well, they they did, and in particular, they were huge supporters of of the arts. First as Dayton Hudson Foundation, then then as Target. And and what we've seen is since the the sort of the collapse in in late two thousand eight, um, a lot of foundations have shifted more toward direct services or or immediate needs. Um, uh, and, and in the case of, of Target, they made a big move that I believe is largely motivated by marketing purposes to uh, invest a billion dollars over some amount of time in, in education. And, um, and so they've taken a pretty big step back from the arts. That in part was, it, it, it wasn't a cause and effect, but it was sort of crisis and relief um, from the the legacy amendment that mm -hmm. that boosted the state fund. So it, there was a deep hole, and it wasn't all the way filled by that public money, but it was significantly it was a significantly stabilizing source of funds for a lot of nonprofits. But just like the story you describe, and I think is probably the same across the country, um, you know, the old money that that built St. Paul and funded the arts as a priority for generations is, is changing. Um, you know, the St. Paul Companies, which was a big insurance provider, very, very generous in the, in the community. They merged with travelers, the headquarters moves out of downtown St. Paul, and suddenly it's a lot harder to get on the phone or out to lunch with the, the CEO to talk about the, the big initiative to build a concert hall or whatever. And, and I think even just the culture of, of individual philanthropy you know, mm -hmm. has changed dramatically as people are much more mobile. Uh, you know, George Pillsbury, like 
got together with John Cole in Pillsbury of Pillsbury and John Coles of the Star and Tribune and I mean all those old timers in that generation, they all got together at the St. Paul Club or the Minneapolis Club and in the steam room somewhere cooked up these ideas to build these <laughs> fabulous arts institutions that we still get to celebrate today. And that, that, that ship sailed and so we're all scrambling to figure out just how we're going to adapt and, and not just Mm -hmm. survive and not just sustain ourselves but thrive and contribute to our communities on behalf of our generation what are the great kind of monuments that we're gonna leave behind well if I can build on that for a minute it, this is something we, we really take to heart with our grant making work actually because you know, the, the guys who did this 100 years ago or 75 years ago they did it out of a sense of benevolence right the institutions were founded to do something good for the community in a very specific way we have this wonderful thing and we want to share it with you. And now our institutions are in such a different time with folks who are mobile and thinking about their relationship with arts and culture completely differently. It's not about benevolence. It's about engaging your community in a meaningful way. And if you can't engage them in a meaningful way, they're going to take their dollars and their time and their resources elsewhere. This is the shift. I don't know if you guys are arts and cultural yeah. professionals. This is the shift you're all working through every single day as a funder. We know that people do what you incent, right? If we put an incentive on something, people mm -hmm. are going to do it, so we need to be really, really careful with the incentives we attach. Mm -hmm. But what we've started to do is change the lens of our grant making so that these public dollars are going toward primarily, and the, the biggest criteria we use is how does your agency connect with your community? Mm -hmm. Tell us who your community is. We're not going to judge who it is. You tell us who it is. Mm -hmm. You tell us how you are engaging them really authentically. Not just, yeah, we do an outreach program or we do a kids program or we do this, that, and the other. You got to do community based programming, right? Mm -hmm. But what are you really doing to engage and demonstrate the public benefit that you are providing back to the community? And if you can do that well, you will come through our process well. If you can't, you won't. And in our grant round in October, we did lose a couple of organizations who could not clearly demonstrate mm. their connection to the public. And is that the place for public investment? That's right. Probably mm -hmm. not, mm -hmm. right? So that the question of how things have changed and what grant makers can do about it and what public dollars mm -hmm. flowing through agencies like sure. ours can do about it, I think mm -hmm. that's a place where we can really help, I hope. There's another aspect of this, though, too. Those other funders are still out there. I mean, they, they haven't completely disappeared. And, and a lot of what I do, and I think we all probably do, is take our priorities, make whatever investments we can in the way of policy, in the way of process, or in the way of dollars, but then I'm on the phone with the program officers and the decision makers at those other foundations yep. saying, look, this is a really cool project. I'm really excited about it. I've been, I've been working myself, you know, five hours, ten hours a week on it for the last couple months. I really need you to be there for it because, you know, without it, I can't carry it on my own. And, and I expect to get those calls occasionally from other funders as well. And um, that is, I think, a role as public institutions mm -hmm. that we can have in setting priorities and, and leveraging, directly leveraging right. with, our, with, our, with our own personal social credibility some of these projects and investments. Yeah, and particularly for community foundations whose role it is to support communities. You know, we sort of touch on an issue that I want to bring up that, that we talked about before, um, and that's the role of public facilities in the cultural life of a city, <coughs> right? We're in a building that used to be the main public library. In, it was built in an era when, you know, the intent was to elevate the masses with right. grand, beautiful public spaces, a gift, the People's Palace, right? This is a sumptuous gift to the public, um, which has remained a gift to the public. Um, and, you know, we're really looking at um, our library system, right, is a distribution network for learning and opportunity, and that, that is there, and we need to leverage it really deeply. Um, and I wonder if you can talk a little bit about the role of public. We don't have a municipal performing arts center here the way other cities have large ones. Um, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit of, about the role of 
you know, just sort of those public spaces, those public facilities. And I know Karen, I'm sort of leading you, um, Karen mentioned that they're thinking of creating uh, something like the Cultural Center. We've actually heard this from many other cities who have come to us for advice. Um, I believe it's either Boulder or Denver wants to create um, a, a cultural center kind of like this building. And so I wonder if you could talk about, each of you talk a little bit about that. We don't have a lot of municipal facilities for cultural uh, pursuits in our community. There are some, certainly. Um, there's a wonderful public hall in Cleveland that was built specifically for public purpose, and we have a new convention center coming online mm -hmm. that is going to be a grand new public space that's going to include some great public art and all of those kind of things. The, the, the thing that we're talking about is how do you reimagine spaces that exist and can you put them toward cultural purposes that are interesting. Yeah. We've had a terrible foreclosure problem in Cleveland. We have a wonderful land bank that is that is mm. capturing houses, doing the appropriate kind of demolition, and then we're turning some of that into great green spaces. That's also stuff we fund as arts and culture. Um, but there's a lot of live work artist stuff happening in some of these neighborhoods that have really been blighted by mm -hmm. foreclosure that's really beginning to turn those neighborhoods around. So more than you know, civic performing arts structures, that's the kind of facilities work that's starting to happen. Mm -hmm. Our agency is not participating in that directly, but mm -hmm. it's part of what we look at. Reimagining existing spaces becomes just as important, especially for a shrinking community, as mm -hmm. building anything new. Yeah. Um, and we're very thoughtful about, we've got a, a bank building that would that I look at as a mini version of this building, which is wonderful. Um, and I, I have no idea what's gonna happen with it because it's owned as a county facility and there's talk of turning it into mixed use retail and different kinds of things, but wouldn't it be grand if it could include a performing arts element, be a, be a gallery space, be something that could be an anchor for a community? And mm -hmm. we haven't quite figured out how it's gonna work yet, but we're we're plotting mm -hmm. to bring them here to These see this These things take a long building. time to come to fruition, for yeah. sure. How about? In, in the context of St. Paul, I, we don't have any directly, I mean, we have a library system, we have a park system, but there are no arts and culture assets that are owned by the city other than, again, the sort of the band shell in, in our parks or mm -hmm. the, you know, those kinds of things. And I, I would probably never advocate that we do um, because I don't believe, based on what I see, that we would be the most efficient and effective mm -hmm. operators of it. The, yeah. the kinds right. of things that come with public ownership specifically public scrutiny, <laughs> are the kinds of things that don't necessarily lead to a strong artistic vision or a strong effective management of a, of a facility. Um, so I generally try to, I mean, that's just not even an option. Mm -hmm. Even for our events, we don't actually run them. I always, there's another nonprofit that I'll reach out and partner with to say, hey, I'll be, with, I'll be there with you 100% of the way we can get our staff, we can help you out, but ultimately it's yours. Mm -hmm. That being said, um, we have a, a theater, an old vaudeville theater called alternately the Palace or the Orpheum. Uh, it's a, um, built in 1916, 1800 seats, 900 up, 900 down, beautiful horseshoe, uh, mezzanine, gorgeous facility. And, um, it's been, it's been absolutely vacant and mothballed for coming on 30 years now. And it's right in the center of downtown. I, I am passionate about finding a new life for this thing. Um, the mayor is particularly passionate about it. As a council member, when he sat on the council, there was a move by the St. Paul companies to buy the property and use it to expand their uh, headquarters. And right alongside the palace, which is in and of itself a historic treasure, but um, there's, I think it's the very first building in, in St. Paul, it's called the Coney Island. So he kind of put his name on the line to save these buildings, um, you know, decades ago. And now before he basically steps down, he's, he's running for re-election right now, but I know part of his legacy desperately wants it to be to breathe new life into this building. But I've spent a lot of time um, working with Jerry Michelson of JAM down here. The, 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 the theater is a, I don't know if you know the Riv, but it's, it's basically the I was a sister of the sister theater sister of, the of the Riviera. Of the sure. Um, but I can't for the life of me figure out a development scheme for it without some kind of 
public or pseudo public ownership. Yeah, they don't pencil out. I mean, we've yeah, it's I've been doing that kind of work for a long time. It, and, <laughs> and tough. And so, and and I don't want it to be the city proper. It could be right. our convention yeah. and visitors authority. Yeah. Um, they they could perhaps be a better manager owner of it than we would. Mm -hmm. It could be our port authority even. Um, but I'm pretty sure I'm gonna, you know, once I look at all the options. I don't think the city will be the best owner. Right, but the city will have to invest in it without oh, we'll, a doubt. We'll have Every to invest in it. In the book, and right? I think it yeah. will need to have some sort of pseudo public ownership. Right, right. Well, we only have about five minutes left. Um, we only took one question. Can we take another question? Well, that's embarrassing. <laughs> Is there another question? Hi, Jess. <laughs> so I um, was thinking about this as a University of Chicago event and thinking about people in the room who are already in the room who are already at Response to something you said, if you choose a few of the initiatives, then you can raise a voice for those and put them forward. Um, I guess, how have you, thinking about again the context of this, um, this lecture, um, how have you engaged those who maybe are recent graduates or young professionals, emerging professionals? Um, sort of out of that constituent myself, I hear a lot of what you're saying being decision makers information. But what about those who have the ability to amplify those initiatives but um, aren't necessarily in positions to make decisions on them? So I'm going to re just repeat the question really quickly. And the question was about how, and when we're prioritizing what we do, and figuring out how we do it, how are we making room for the young, emerging, creative professional to have a real role? and to be really engaged. I hope I've said that somewhat accurately. Um, that is a good question. <laughs> we had, um, I'll, I'll start off with a brief answer, and I'll tell you, the under 25 is a really tough group to reach. Um, we did a huge engagement through digital and social media, and um, it was one way to reach people who were really mobile and didn't don't necessarily have the habit of going to public meetings. Um, so our in-person engagement would probably skewed quite a bit older, but um, we're embracing a whole DIY um, attitude about the cultural plan and we want people to tell us what they're working on. There's young artists, there's a young artist in South Logan Square who's you know doing a DIY storefront studio project and is enormous amounts of um, capacity that she's developed really scrappy doing it all right. So I feel like in our cultural plan, especially because it's so broad, there's a lot of room for that. Um, I, don't, I don't have a really clear sense of the best way to reach um, the really young people just yet. I think I hear, though, part, partly in your question, you, you solicit our input, but then the decision makers don't necessarily want to take it. What do we do about that? Mm. Maybe, in, and maybe I'm reading that, reading that wrong, but part of what I hear from the young professionals groups, and there are many of them around Cleveland, is we're here, we're ready to change it, we really want to get involved, we put forward our ideas, and the decision maker layer says, we don't do it that way. Um, and I think that's one of those questions that we really have to be thoughtful about and be prepared to say, okay, so, we don't, so we've never done it that way, who cares? If it's a good idea and there's a constituent of people who are ready to run with it, and I mean really run with it, not just say they're going to do it, but actually get in there and say, we're going to advocate with the young professionals to make sure that these dollars continue to serve arts and culture in our community, assuming arts and culture is ready to engage us in a different way. Uh, then, then I think something interesting can happen. But I, I think we have to, as a cultural community, I think for as creative as we all are, sometimes we are very stuck on what has been. And uh, the, the demography of our country, not just in age, but in everything else, is changing so radically we really have to be willing to listen to all the voices who bring good ideas at the table and actually be willing to act on them and mm -hmm. engage them. And uh, hopefully we can make that work. Go ahead and do it. Yeah. yeah. Just go and yeah. do it. Um, with, with 241 different <laughs> ideas about yeah, what right. these guys want to do, pick the one you want to do and make it happen. Mm -hmm. Go out and yeah. organize. You know, I mean, I, before this, I was a community organizer. And before mm -hmm. there was President Obama, Nobody knew what that was, so I just called myself a paid radical. Um, but um, you can set the priority, 
but not by, not by saying, gosh, why aren't they doing the thing I want to do or why isn't anybody asking me? Um, just do your thing, whatever it is. If it's, if it's creating gallery space in a neighborhood that needs it or, or seeing an opportunity that's unmet, you know, a need rather that's unmet, uh, just go and start. You might not have any clue how to actually finish, but go and start. And if it's on the list, mm -hmm. chances are, if I'm, in, if I'm in your seat, I say, oh, hell, it's been six months, or whatever, you know, however long We're gonna been. claim it. We wanna claim it. No, <laughs> no for sure. Right, yeah. You know, and, our and plan is best... not just the city's government plan, it's the right. plan for the whole city. It's by design meant to, for everyone to implement it. I, on the phone, I was much more vociferous. I don't really buy plans. I think it's a kind of a waste of time and effort and money. Um, and I'm sorry to criticize all, all your effort, but, it, but it's precisely because I think when we're doing our jobs well, we've got the ability to respond to our best opportunities. And the best opportunities, a huge part of that, is where we see talent in the community. When I look out and I sort of, there are, it's, it's easy to spot like the, the doers that are gonna make something happen and transform a particular corner. I hitch myself to that wagon so fast and pump as much wind into their sails as I can, to mix metaphors quite intentionally. I do everything I can to, to raise their profile because then yeah. when, we do, when we go to cut the ribbon on the Artist Commission mini golf course at the Schmidt Brewery, real project. <laughs> And I love it mostly because I love the team of people that are working on it. I'm going to do everything I can right now to support them, including helping, helping get, get them the Art Place funds that they've, they've asked for, to get funds from McKnight, to help them with, my, you know, with, with whatever resources I can bring to the table, with advice. Because when, when we cut the ribbon and we're all out there with our putters, I want Chris Coleman to get the credit for that. Mm -hmm. Not that he did it, and not that I did it. I don't actually do anything in this city. I get other people to do stuff, and I support other people doing their things. So just go do your thing, whatever it is, yeah. and have faith in it and believe in it, and these guys will hitch their wagon to it. Yeah, I think that's a, a great note uh, to wrap up on. I'm sorry if you guys had other questions, but we can chat after. Thank you.